One, two, three, four, five. Five seconds doesn't seem like a long time. Five seconds just passed in what feels like no time at all. But what if the world lost oxygen for five seconds? You might think that you could hold your breath for five seconds and life would go on as normal afterward. I mean realistically most people could hold their breath for five seconds. In fact, most people can hold their breath for at least 30 seconds. But if oxygen entirely disappeared for five seconds, that's another story. Oxygen is necessary for life on earth as we know it. Oxygen is not only in the air we breathe, it's in the water and it also makes up 45% of the earth's crust. Concrete relies on oxygen. Vehicles with internal combustion engines need oxygen. There are countless ways that life would be affected if the world lost oxygen for 5 seconds. Today, life's biggest questions asks, what if the world lost oxygen for 5 seconds? Nitrogen is the most abundant gas in the universe, but oxygen is the most vital to us. Life as we know it could not exist without it. If the world lost oxygen in the air we breathe for 5 seconds, we likely wouldn't even notice. I mean, maybe we might think it's a bit weird when we can't take a breath, but we wouldn't die from it. The Oxygen would come back after 5 seconds, and that works out to be no more than 4 breath attempts. There definitely wouldn't be mass suffocation occurring across the globe, if that's what you're picturing. But I'm not just talking about oxygen in the air. Oxygen exists all around us. If the world lost oxygen for 5 seconds, at least it would be a pretty amazing thing to witness. First, as soon as the oxygen was gone, the sky would become black. We see blue skies because of oxygen particles in the atmosphere. Without oxygen, there are fewer particles in the air, meaning fewer particles for light to bounce off of. This would result in a dark sky sky with an extremely bright sun, and that bright sun would be nasty as hell. While the world lost oxygen for 5 seconds, everyone outside would suffer from devastating sunburns. Without oxygen, we would have no ozone layer. The ozone layer protects us on earth from the devastating effects of the sun, and molecular oxygen in the air also protects our skin from UV light. Anyone outside or sun tanning on a beach while the world lost oxygen gets second or even third degree sunburns. If that doesn't sound scary enough for you, 5 seconds without oxygen would result in everyone's ears exploding. Yes, your eardrum depends on oxygen. Without oxygen, there would be far less air pressure, 21% less air pressure to be exact. Whenever there's a change in pressure, people can experience barotrauma. You know when you're on an airplane and the air pressure suddenly changes and your ears pop? Yeah, like that, but it would be way worse if we lost oxygen, even for 5 seconds. In fact, people wouldn't just lose hearing or experience ear popping, eardrums would explode. 7 billion people's ears exploding simultaneously? That definitely wouldn't be pleasant. And while everyone's eardrums are exploding, they'd have to get out of the way of falling into infrastructure and debris. Oxygen binds the molecules in concrete together. Without it, structures that are made out of concrete like the Hoover Dam, the Panama Canal, the Pantheon and the Burj Khalifa would crumble and essentially be reduced to dust. And after all of this happens, millions of people will be stuck under the weight of the dust from the concrete buildings. And it's not just concrete structures that will be affected. Any untreated metal on earth would become fused together if the world lost oxygen. Most metals have a layer of oxidation on them to prevent them from welding together. Without the oxidation layer, metals would instantly bind to each other. And if you were driving at the time that the world lost oxygen, your vehicle would come to a standstill while you cry from the pain of your exploding ears. Vehicles that have internal combustion engines rely on oxygen to function. Without oxygen, they would simply stop working. Without oxygen, there can't be fire. And without fire, there's no way for engines to burn fuel, which allows them to start or keep running. While every fire on Earth simultaneously went out, cars across the globe would stop in their tracks. Every car that wasn't an electric car would be affected. This wouldn't be so bad for the people on the ground. But what about air? Planes. There's an average of 100,000 flights every single day. Thousands take place every hour. In the event that the Earth lost oxygen for five seconds, the thousands of airplanes and helicopters that were flying at the time would fall from the sky and hit the ground. Some of these airplanes might be able to glide for five seconds, but many would drop like flies, instantly killing those aboard the plane and also those who were unfortunate enough to be underneath them when they crashed. But honestly, planes wouldn't have anything to crash into in the first place because the ground on Earth would crumble if the world lost oxygen for five seconds. Oh yeah, I forgot that little detail. Maybe I should have led with that, but whatever, we're talking about it now. Oxygen makes up 45% of the Earth's crust. Without it, the ground below us would crumble, and we would all free fall into the Earth's core. And let's not forget water, good old H2O. Water is made up of one third oxygen. Without oxygen in a water molecule, there's only hydrogen. When oxygen is removed from a water molecule, hydrogen turns into gas and expands in volume. Water makes up around 71% of the Earth's surface. Oceans hold around 96.5% of the Earth's water. Without oxygen, every body of water would 
essentially evaporate instantaneously, and without an ozone layer, hydrogen would float up into space. All of this wouldn't necessarily suck that much because it's not like we would be alive when it happens. Human beings are also made up of mostly water. Human beings and other living things would essentially vaporize without the presence of oxygen, even for 5 seconds. Essentially, without oxygen, our world would be an extremely dry, hot place. Thankfully, there is no way that this would ever happen. At least, I'm pretty sure it wouldn't. But it's fun to think about now, isn't it? The universe is jam packed with weird, mind bending celestial bodies that often test the outer limits of our understanding of theoretical physics. Throughout history, every now and then, a few cosmic flies in the ointment have turned up, leaving physicists scratching their heads saying, yeah, this is how it should work, but yeah, it's anyone's guess really. One of those particular cosmic weirdos in question is the infamous neutron star, the strange wilderness era for any lucky solar sun in their celestial life cycle of the universe, where after being really big, they suddenly get really small and really dense, and physics just has to leave them be and let them do their thing. But what if our sun suddenly and out of nowhere became a neutron star? Well, let's find out. What if our sun was a neutron star? For the curious amongst you, that clip was from Danny Boyle's sci-fi extravaganza, Sunshine. And yeah, come on guys, this video is about our sun, so we've at least got to build some visual tension and atmospherically set the scene, right? Right. It leads us to an important point though, because there are no visual depictions of a neutron star because, well, they're so weird and so small that all the technology on the planet still couldn't manage to muster a few snapshots of the strange and mysterious solar bodies. But that's okay, because we've got everyone's favourite visual supplement to set the scene. Theoretical physics. Right then, so neutron stars, what are they and what's the big deal? Well, in short, neutron stars are the collapsed cause of massive suns, but they have a few very particular parameters that they need to meet before they can call themselves Neutron. Our sun, Sol, is pretty middle of the pack when it comes to the weirdness of far-flung celestial bodies, but stars with a much larger mass than our sun burn out after just a few million years in a massive galaxy rocking explosion known as a supernova. During a supernova, all of the inner cosmic mush of the star in question, millions of tons of plasma and neutrinos, get ejected out from its core at the speed of light. But strangely enough, sometimes there's something left behind. And that little guy is a neutron star. Now it's important to note that our sun will never become a neutron star because it doesn't meet those very specific set of parameters and conditions needed for it to turn into one. Neutron stars are born from suns that are 10 to 20 times the size of Sol and in around 5 billion years the life cycle of our sun will lead it to become a red giant and then eventually a cold white dwarf. Which is vaguely similar to a neutron star without the weirdness just much larger and far less dense. But we don't want that do we because this is a hypothetical life's biggest question and we want to know what this would mean for our sun and how damn dangerous things would get very, very quickly. What? You didn't expect a happy ending, did you? Well, it's no kept secret that a neutron star is one of the strangest things in our universe. It's right up there with dark energy and white holes, giant flying spaghetti monsters, Cthulhu and all his buddies. Because after spending its life as an absolutely massive star, post supernova it shrinks down to roughly the size of a small city, around 20 kilometers from head to toe. But you know that stars are spherical, don't you? So don't worry about metaphorical appendages. The thing is though, the fact that these things are absolutely tiny on the scale of the universe, it doesn't account for the fact that a single cubic centimetre of a neutron star weighs roughly 400 million tons. A single cubic centimetre. Now multiply those centimetres by several hundred million and you get, yes, a pretty hefty small boy. In fact, even at that size, thanks to the weirdness of a neutron star's physics, its gravitational force would be roughly 2 billion times stronger than Earth's. That means quicker than a rat up a drain pipe, every single planet in our solar system would be instantly pulled toward the neutron star and destroyed in a hail of cosmic hellfire. Yeah, that's not so good. Also, things wouldn't just end there. I Either because these little guys rotate at a phenomenal speed outside of our given understanding of galactic orbit. You see, whereas our sun rotates once every 27 days or so, a neutron star would rotate roughly 700 times every second, and it would be hurtling through space at one fifth the speed of light like a toddler at a Red Bull convention. In fact, if our sun was a neutron star, we'd likely never even know it, as life and everything in the galaxy would swiftly come to an end in the spark of an instant. 
That's if our sun suddenly morphed into a neutron star, but what if one of those guys came hurtling at us from the deep depths of space without a second thought? Even though a neutron star is roughly only 20 kilometers wide, when compared to our planet, which has a diameter of 13,000 kilometers, you may think that it'd be just like getting hit by an asteroid, but we're also forgetting how heavy these things are. Remember when I said a single cubic centimeter of a neutron star weighed roughly 400 million tons? Well, yeah. If it impacted our Earth, it would be like shooting a bullet through a watermelon. In fact, it's one of the few cosmic entities in the known universe that would literally obliterate our Earth by passing through the core of our planet and exiting out of the other side, 360 no scope and all. Yeah, it's safe to say these guys are pretty deadly and under any theoretical scenario, things would be really, really bad if our sun ever became a neutron star. But is there any upside to our sun ever being a neutron star? Hypothetically, of course. Well, perhaps, but we'd have to change the mechanics of our solar system for that to even be an option. You see, because despite all of the cosmic calamity that these little guys can cause, it is still often theorized that neutron stars across the universe may have planets in orbit, albeit in a very precarious balance, stuck between a rock and a hard place, so to speak. You see, because neutron stars have such an overwhelming magnetic force, life on such a planet could harness that power, similar to how we harness visible light from Sol. Of course, for the most part, a neutron star would emit enough light energy, but the overwhelming radiation from its magnetic force could have completely shaped its course and evolution of any sentient life. An entirely new concept of life could have grown on this hypothetical planet that hangs in the delicate balance of a neutron star's orbit. Sentient life that fed on radiated cosmic energy to become an entirely different life form than that of humanity, using galactic cosmic rays to sustain themselves and perhaps become an even more efficient extraterrestrial life. Heck, if this radiated alien species became an advanced enough civilization, they could even perhaps construct a Dyson Sphere, a hypothetical megastructure that completely encompasses the star and efficiently harnesses its energy. There's one thing for certain, whichever way you spin it, a neutron star has more potential energy than any known cosmic entity in our galaxy. If a civilization was lucky enough to grow in the strange, delicate balance of having a neutron star as a sun and survive its cosmic calamity and all the things that come with having one of the most earth-shattering entities in the known universe as a neighbor, then there's also a very good chance that their civilization would be incredibly advanced thanks to the potential technological abundance of a neutron star. Hey, if that's the case, maybe they'll be paying us a visit sometime soon. Oh. I hope they're nice. We've covered a lot of the weird and wonderful cosmic mechanics of the universe over here at Life's Biggest Questions, from black holes to white holes to dark energy and neutron stars, and seemingly it's relatively entertaining to fit them into differing hypothetical models to ponder on what impacts these cosmic wonders would have for life down here on Earth. Perhaps one of the most perplexing of these then are the notoriously rare pulsars, the product of a cosmic event that occurs under extraordinarily rare circumstances in the life cycle of a neutron star. But what would happen if our planet had hit the intergalactic jackpot? What would happen if Earth found its home amongst these weird enigmas of physics? Well, let's find out. What if Earth orbited a pulsar? Roll the clip. For the curious amongst you, that clip was from Terence Malick's mind-bending cinematic depiction of existence in the universe, Tree of Life. And hey, what can I say, I'm a stickler for visuals, and it's not exactly the easiest thing to do, is it, finding a visual interpretation of one of the rarest cosmic events in the universe. Pulsars, man. Pulsars, they're crafty little fellas. Anyway, it leads us to an important opening notion. Are there, in fact, any known planets that have ever orbited or are already in orbit of a pulsar? Well, yes, in fact, perhaps only one that's ever been discovered by science. But before we blast off over to that insanely awesome cosmic phenomenon, let's first take a look at exactly what these things are. In our last video, we spoke about what would happen if our sun ever turned into a neutron star, the life cycle of a particularly large solar body that after going supernova turns into one of the strangest entities in the known universe. If you'd like to find out more about that particular neutron star in question, then make sure to head over to our playlist to find out more. But for 
those of you that aren't so inclined, we'll rush through the basic mechanics. Every star in the universe has a life cycle, and under certain circumstances, particularly large stars have a habit of getting so big that they explode in a supernova of celestial destruction, leaving behind a neutron star that's incredibly small, but also incredibly dense, and has one of the strongest gravitational forces in the known universe. There are thought to be about 1 million neutron stars in the known universe, but an even rarer version of a neutron star is known as a pulsar. And if you thought neutron stars were weird, then these guys are much much more bizarre. In exactly the same manner that neutron stars spin rapidly and produce incredibly strong electromagnetic radiation, a pulsar releases that radiation along a narrow beam, almost like a lighthouse. And because a pulsar spins at such a consistent speed, they produce a very precise interval between pulses, hence the name, and function like some weird cosmic lighthouse out there in the void of space. Now, obviously, we're teetering on the edge of theoretical physics here, but there's actually quite a lot of evidence to support the mechanical workings of a pulsar. In fact, the first ever pulsar was discovered way back in 1967 by Jocelyn Bell Burnell and Anthony Hewish at the University of Cambridge, who noticed that a solar entity under their observation flickered with precise pulses, and deduced that it must have something to do with the rotational spin of the star under some kind of emission of wavelength energy. Obviously, there was much more to their work, and their efforts even earned them a Nobel Prize in physics. Good job, guys. It leads us to an interesting interesting point for our theoretical planetary orbit though, because the pulsar that Bell and Hewish first discovered, which is now named CP1919, produces radio wavelengths as its bright burst of magnetic radiation, but in fact, pulsars have also later been found to produce radiation in the form of both X-ray and gamma-ray wavelengths. Well, you may think that's a bad thing, and well, it is, because any solar body that produces narrow beams of deadly radiation spells bad news for any exoplanet caught in the pulsar's orbit, and it quickly makes things incredibly difficult for us as a hypothetical species to survive. In fact, it's incredibly rare for any kind of planet to orbit a pulsar, but they do, in fact, exist. Hold on to your hats, but PSR B1257 plus 12 is a pulsar pulsar star located around 2,300 light years away from our sun in the constellation of Virgo. Thankfully for us though, it's also referred to as Lich, as in yes, the undead necromancer of myth and legend. What makes Lich so damn interesting though, is that it's a pulsar star that has three different planets in its orbit, an incredibly rare celestial phenomenon. Those planets are known as Draugr, Poltergeist, and Phobator. Pretty damn heavy metal, right? Well, actually, it's funny we should say that, because because life on any one of these planets would be damn scarier than any Lamb of God and Cradle of Filth album combined, and we can only imagine the terrifying events that would occur if Earth was one of those unlucky planets in orbit. Because of the mechanics of a pulsar star's orbit, having a pulsar as a solar entity would be like a giant strobe light flashing on and off. Fraternity. Every day would be day, night, day, night, day, night, every second passing by as light and dark in an instant. That would only be during the actual day though, and if we accept that our Earth would have a similar orbit that it does now, night would be pretty much the same, giving everyone on Earth 12 precious hours to rest their eyes from the constant strobing chaos and chance to figure out how on Earth we get back to our warm, loving, life-giving sun. It would be like being imprisoned in a really crap disco that you didn't ever want to go to with a terrible DJ and no friends, only forever, endlessly and you can't escape. Also, it's pretty important that we mention the light that hits you during the day is perhaps some of the most deadly radiated energy forces in the universe. Supercharged X-ray and or gamma radiation that would certainly strip the very iron from your blood, turn your eyeballs to jelly, vaporize you at the molecular level, and also all of the above. Uh, yeah. And I know we've been trying our hardest to steer away from this particular hypothetical conclusion, but if Earth orbited a pulsar, it's very likely that everyone would die and our civilization would be over in a matter of seconds, vaporized by a literal cosmic tornado. Not only that though, but once we're all fried to oblivion, it would happen over and over again, frying us with super intense electromagnetic radiation at regular precise intervals. So precise, in fact, that our molecularly charged civilization would be potentially more accurate than an atomic clock, and 
Hey, perhaps we could even serve as some form of time telling device for a far advanced alien civilization that were wise enough to know that orbiting a pulsar would be a really, really, really bad thing to do. I'm sure that you're all aware over here at Life's Biggest Questions, we've got quite the hankering for those complete and utter mind bending enigmas of physics that keep us up at night wondering how long we've got left before they gobble up the entire universe and everything else with it. And no, I'm not talking about Cthulhu, I'm talking about black holes, although it's it's not entirely outside the realms of possibility that an eldritch great old one is lurking just behind the veil of the event horizon. But that's a different thought entirely, and one that I'd rather leave tucked comfortably in the far recesses of my mind. No, today we're going to be peeling back the lid of the cosmos in a different kind of dimensional manner. What's behind a black hole? Roll the clip. A star, more than three times the size of our sun, ought to end its life how? with a collapse. For the curious amongst you, that scene was from the incredible 2014 biopic of the legendary Stephen Hawking's life and work, The Theory of Everything, where a young Hawking had just put two and two together based upon the theory of Sir Roger Penrose, and first began his eureka moment about the relationship between space, time, black holes, the universe, and, well, everything. And while it's important to note that while we've covered quite a few black hole escapades already, we're going to initially be paying our dues to some of the greatest minds that physics has gifted us so far, and answer this question with a very brief proposition. What's behind a black hole? While well, based on our current understanding of physics, nothing at all. No time, no space, just the singularity, the end of all things. But as is the case with many things, there may be something more to it, and theoretically speaking, what lies beneath these cosmic enigmas are the root of some of the greatest mysteries in our universe. Now obviously you may be thinking, behind a black hole, as in physically behind? That's ridiculous, how could you go behind a literal puncture hole in the fabric of time and space? And well, the quick answer is, you're doing it right now, because as we speak at the center of our galaxy, there's a supermassive black hole known as Sagittarius A star, and pretty much everything in the entire Milky Way galaxy, from our point of view, is behind that black hole in a fashion. So there's your answer. What's behind a black hole? Me, and you, and everyone, thanks to the beauty of perspective. All right guys, show's over. I'll show myself out. Okay, okay, I'll digress, because of course that's a cop-out. However, because of that orbital effect in particular, we can actually bear witness to one of the most interesting and mind-bending events in the universe, where essentially, if something is sufficiently luminous enough, such as a galaxy or a cluster of galaxies, that then passes behind a black hole from our observational position, a phenomenon then occurs that is known as gravitational lensing. And here's where things get really, really interesting. As the two objects pass between each other, we as observers would see the light of the luminous celestial object bend around the black hole as it passed, almost like a wave crashing against a tidal break. And what we then see is the immense mass of the black hole actually curving the space-time around it, so that the light from the distant luminous celestial objects, well, the light that doesn't go straight into the black hole that is, curves around it as well, before passing on freely. In fact, gravitational lensing is often used as a sort of magnifying glass in astronomy, amplifying the light visibility of objects that are otherwise too far to be observed through conventional technological means. Essentially, in respect to black holes in particular, this effect only occurs because there is nothing behind a black hole, but that doesn't necessarily mean what you think it may. In fact, it may be incredibly difficult for us to wrap our brains around the fact that there is essentially not a thing as we know it behind a black hole, to the observable universe anyway. After all, if an object of matter exists in the physical space of the universe, no matter its physical dimensions, there has to be something behind it right? We know what's behind the moon, we know what's behind an asteroid, we know what's behind the Tesla Roadster currently spinning its way across our solar system. They're three-dimensional objects, we know exactly where we stand with them, as well as all of the things that comprise the space between our Earth and their relative position in the cosmos. So what about black holes then? If they're not three-dimensional objects as we know them, then what are they? One-dimensional objects? Perhaps? Maybe something like an electron? 
that would make the most sense, wouldn't it, given the fact that an electron is a one-dimensional point embedded into three-dimensional space. Well, as far as we can tell, anyway. The thing is, it is often said by physicists that physics makes sense until you go into a black hole. And that's where the real paradox of this notion becomes apparent. Every single image of a black hole that you've ever seen has been depicted in the exact same way. And if that's not already confusing enough, then let me put it this way. Any image of a black hole is a two-dimensional projection of a three-dimensional event that's made to represent a zero-dimensional mathematical absolution known as a singularity. Yeah, exactly. And if things weren't already confusing enough, black holes, well, technically speaking, the event horizon of a black hole are three-dimensional celestial objects, but at the same time, they also fit the parameters of potentially being four-dimensional objects, too. In fact, thanks to the scientific solution known as the Schwarzschild radius, which dictates that the properties of space-time inside of a black hole are entirely different than the rest of space, we stumble deeper into the ever-mind-boggling long grass that is string theory, which suggests that black holes could very likely exist on up to an 11 dimensional framework. And I'm not even going to try and take a guess at what lies behind that. But here's another curveball that's just mustered up enough escape velocity and made it out of the event horizon of this particular life's biggest question. Because very recently, as you all may know, our human species hit a home run. And we actually captured a whole damn image of a black hole for the first time in forever. Well, Kind of, it was more like trying to take a photo from Earth of a DVD on the moon, but hey, it worked, and it's probably one of the most important discoveries in physics in a long, long time. Perhaps though, coded within its pixels will lie the answer to the mind-bending spatial properties of black holes, and who knows, maybe we'll know exactly what dimensional plane we're looking at these things from. In all likelihood, it will probably just pose many more questions than answers, but hey, that's the fun part, isn't it? Well, there we have it, our short and long answer to the question, what's behind a black hole? Me, and you, the rest of the planet, and who the hell knows? Probably like at least seven more dimensions of even more questions. Yeah, that sounds about right. As of right now, our sun is pretty much the only star around. The closest neighboring star is four light years away, in Alpha Centauri. Sure, four light years might not seem like a lot in cosmic terms, but it definitely is a long way away. Scientists predict that a million years in the future, 1.3 million years to be exact, another star will visit our solar system. That star is called Gliese 710, and it's only expected to visit for a short time. But what if this star decided to stay in our solar system and begin traveling toward our sun? eventually hitting it. Today, Life's Biggest Questions asks, what if our sun hit another star? There's actually a scientific term for this, it's called a stellar collision. It's defined as the coming together of two stars caused by stellar dynamics within a star cluster, or by the orbital decay of a binary star due to stellar mass loss or gravitational radiation. While it's extremely uncommon for a star to collide with another star, this type of event is estimated to occur once every 10,000 years. Scientists know it occurs because they've actually observed it happening. Back in September of 2008, scientists observed a stellar merger in Scorpius. At the time, they had no idea what they had just witnessed. It's believed that any stars in the universe can collide while fusion is still active, but also while they are dead stars, which is when fusion is no longer taking place. The star that is most likely to collide with our sun is Gliese 710, which is 60% as massive as the sun. Though it's estimated that Gliese won't get too close, it will hang out in the Oort cloud, which is the ring of dust, rocks, comets and debris that circles the furthest edges of our solar system. Even so, Gliese will be 1.4 trillion miles away from us, but will shine brightly in the night sky, very brightly, around three times as brightly as Mars. Though there's no chance that it will collide with any of the larger objects in our solar system, it very well could shoot comets and debris into our solar system that have the potential to hit Earth. This actually won't be the first time that another star has entered our solar system. It happened once before, and not that long ago either, when early humans were around. 70,000 years ago, a dwarf star entered the Oort cloud, and scientists think that this type of event could have caused mass extinction events on Earth, like the asteroid that is said to have killed the dinosaurs. If a star that far away did enough damage to our planet to permanently eradicate dinosaurs from the face of the earth, imagine what would happen if a star got close enough to hit our sun. If our sun collided with another star, we definitely wouldn't be around to witness it. It implies that another star would have to get close enough to our sun that both stars would light up the sky, either doubling or significantly increasing the amount of solar energy our planet receives. That would essentially cook our planet. 
As the invading star got closer to our sun, there would be an epic battle between their competing gravitational forces. They would throw mass and gas in every direction. So if there were any life forms left on Earth at this point, there definitely wouldn't be after this happens. Once the star actually collided with our sun, it would cause a massive explosion, likely big enough to destroy most of the planets in our solar system, and send gravitational waves rippling through the universe. We know this because a gravitational wave was detected on August 25th, 2017, and it was believed to have been a associated with the merger of two neutron stars in a distant galaxy. This was the first time that an event like this was observed via gravitational radiation. The exact timeline of events of a stellar collision depend on the type of star. Normal stars like our sun are called main sequence stars. These stars only merge in places where there are many stars in a small area of space, a globular cluster. It's believed that when stars merge in globular clusters, they actually form one star, one very hot bright star. The subsequent star would be blue as hot stars are blue. But let's say this is a few hundred million years in the future and our sun is a white dwarf. Let's say a white dwarf star collided with our white dwarf sun. We also know what happens when white dwarf stars collide. It's called a type 1a supernova, a massive explosion that totally destroys both stars. This would create very bright, luminous energy. Particles like the atomic nuclei of these stars could also be ejected in the explosion. The nuclei will collide with each other and be bombarded by neutrons, which would then convert them into different elements. Interestingly, many of the heavy elements in our universe are formed in this way. Well, there you have it. This is what would happen if our sun hit another star. Are you surprised? The Earth and the Moon. A tale as old as time. We know that the Earth has a natural satellite called the Moon that orbits around our planet. Don't believe me? Look up at the sky. Scientists think that the Moon formed around 4.5 billion years ago, when the early Earth, known as Gaia, collided with another planet. This collision caused a piece of our planet to break off, eventually forming the Moon, which now orbits our planet. But what if it were the other way around? What if the Earth orbited the moon? That is the question we are asking right now on Life's Biggest Questions. There are two ways in which it could be possible for the Earth to orbit the moon. The first, the Earth would have to be far less massive than the moon. The moon weighs about 80 times less than the Earth. The moon's diameter is 2,159 miles, about one quarter the size of the Earth's. So the Earth would have to be smaller than a quarter of its current size for it to be pulled in by the moon's gravity and be locked into its orbit. Either that or the moon would have to be much bigger than the Earth. For simplicity's sake, let's choose the second option. If the Earth orbited the Moon, then that would make our Earth a Moon and the Moon a planet. From Earth, the Moon would look gigantic. It would take up a huge portion of the sky. If the Earth orbited the Moon, that would mean that from Earth, we would be able to see the dark side of the Moon. As it stands, we do not see the dark side of the Moon, known as the far side of the Moon. The far side of the Moon is technically not the dark side of the Moon because it's not always dark. When the Moon is between the Earth and the Sun, during the new Moon phase, that is when the back side of the Moon is bathed in sunlight. But we don't see it. If the Earth were orbiting the Moon, we would definitely be able to see what's on the other side of it. My guess is it looks a whole lot like the visible side of the Moon. Who knows, maybe there's an ancient civilization on the far side of the Moon, but that's highly unlikely. The question is, would life still exist if Earth were smaller than the Moon? Considering how much the Moon affects our planet already, even though it's only 27% the size of the Earth, the chances of life existing as we know know it on Earth would be very slim. Just like how the Earth's gravitational pull affects the Moon, the Moon's gravitational pull affects us. Other than the tides, our Moon actually prevents the Earth from wobbling on its axis. Mars wobbles around on its axis quite a lot, likely because it has two very small moons that don't have very much of a gravitational impact on it. The tilt of the Earth would be even more stable if the Earth orbited the Moon. Experts think that if our Moon was far bigger, it wouldn't have much of an effect on the stability of the Earth. It would likely even make climate on Earth far are more stable. Ice ages might happen far less often. The entire history of our planet might be different. Humans might not have advanced to what they are now because experts believe that the ice age is what forced humans to implement agriculture. If the earth orbited the moon, it would mean that an average day on earth would be much longer. Scientists know this from looking at other planets. Pluto for example has a moon that's almost half its size, Charon. Pluto and Charon are tidally locked onto each other. They spin around together. If the earth orbited the moon, that could quite possibly mean that the earth would be tidally locked onto the moon. All of the earth would still get sunlight.
sunlight, but the amount of time that parts of the Earth got sunlight would definitely change. Imagine an entire side of Earth not getting sunlight for weeks at a time. That would make it pretty difficult for life to exist as we know it. It should be noted that there are areas of Earth that don't get sunlight for extended periods of time, like the Arctic Circle. Life and humans still exist in the Arctic Circle even without the sun for 6 months at a time. Still though, an Earth that's actually a moon orbiting the moon would definitely be a strange place to live. I think I'd like to keep things the way they are for the time being. I'm at the foot of the ladder. The LM foot pads are only depressed in the surface about 1 or 2 inches. I'm gonna step off the LM now. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. The infamous words spoken by Neil Armstrong as he became the first man to walk on the moon. A very historic moment in history that fueled America and crushed the Soviet Union's dreams. But what would happen if it didn't play out like that? Well, that's exactly what we will be discussing today. What if Soviet Russia won the space race? So let's start from the very beginning. It's the mid 20th century and World War II is at its end point. But it's not over just yet. A new conflict has arised. The Cold War. Tensions between the Soviet Union and the United States are at a high. Then in the late 1950s, space became the battlefield for their competition. Both parties fought to be the first in spaceflight capability. But there could only be one winner. On October 4th, 1957, the Soviets launched Sputnik, which is Russian for Traveler, which became the world's first artificial satellite and first man-made object to make it to Earth's orbit. This was greeted with a huge Huge surprise! Americans were left speechless. How could they have successfully done this before the US? Especially since they were left devastated after World War II. This was the beginning of a very long and devastating competition. Less than a month later, the Soviets launched Sputnik 2, which contained a dog named Laika. It wasn't until 1958 that the US received their first achievement in the space race. They launched a satellite named Explorer 1. That same year, NASA was founded and announced that they were determined to send humans to space. Now, for the first half of the race, it was said that the Soviets were way more ahead than the US. They had many firsts. They had Luna 1, the first artificial object to escape Earth, Luna 2, the first spacecraft to reach the moon, and Venera, the first spacecraft to head towards Venus. The US was way behind. Then in April of 1961, the Soviets sent Yuri Gagarin out to space, and he he became the first person to orbit Earth. But all of these successes did not stop the US from trying. In fact, it propelled them into working faster and harder. On May 5th, astronaut Alan Shepard became the first American in space. After that success, President John F. Kennedy announced that the US would land a man on the moon before the end of the decade. Then, a few months later, he delivered his famous moon speech, which included the line, We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Or maybe it's because you really wanted to show the Soviets who's boss. Over the next few years, each participant in the race took several firsts. In 1962, the US had their first interplanetary flyby with Mariner 2 passing by Venus. And then they had the first Mars flyby in 1965 with Mariner 4. But the Soviets sent the first woman into space, Valentina Tereshkova, in 1963. The US didn't achieve this until 20 years later. Nonetheless, it seemed like the two were neck and neck battling for first place. Sure, they both accomplished accomplished many historic firsts with regards to space, but they both wanted to be the first one to send a human to the moon. In 1963, three American astronauts were killed during a launch, but the US kept pushing through. In 1968, they launched Apollo 8, which was the first manned space mission to orbit the moon. And then finally, on July 16, 1969, Neil Armstrong, Edwin Buzz Aldrin and Michael Collins set off on a mission to land on the moon, and it was successful. And from there, the US won the space race, or at least it's widely considered that they did. That was quite a long journey, with several failed attempts along the way on both sides. But what would have happened if they didn't win the space race? That's the question we need answers to. So the first theory is by space historian Dr. Christopher Riley. He believes that if the Soviets won the space race, then they would have continued on with multiple other moon missions, and they may have even built lunar bases. If Soviet Russia won, that means they may start taking things to the next level. What else can they beat the states at? 
What else can they do in outer space to continue proving to other countries that they are the boss? It would eventually get very costly. Who knows where they would start pulling funds from. Furthermore, this win might just fuel Russia. In 1947 and 1952, magazines in the states were saying that the first in space will win the Cold War. But space policy expert at American University Howard McCurdy said that what this really meant was that the nation that wins the space race will control the earth and space. So the Soviets would get super cocky and be like, we are the masters of the space, our next step is to conquer the world. If this is true and they claim space, then they may try to stop the US from doing any venturing to space. The Soviets will probably be like, oh, we got here first, so we have dibs on space, even though that's not really how it works. But if that did happen, then all of the discoveries NASA has made would no longer be a thing unless they fought for control. Let's move on to our next point. So if America did lose, one of two things may also happen. The first being, they massively cut down NASA's funding and place the money into a system they can trust, like military projects or something like that. Or they increase NASA's funding to try to become better than the Soviets. Since the Soviets got a man on the moon before them, they will be under immense pressure to do the same and quickly. They wouldn't want to be too far behind. The Soviets may have done it first, but the US would still want to prove that they can do it as well. But this may result in the US rushing the attempts to try and do it as quickly as possible, meaning they are leaving more room for error. Rushing this could lead to more deaths of their crew members, but the competition wouldn't stop there. The US may just do something outrageous to try and one up them. Maybe it's doing something like sending a whole family to the moon. Stuff like that to prove to the Soviets that, hey, you may have gotten the first man on the moon, but we got the first family on the moon, huh? Beat that. Then you'll just have an ongoing cycle of both sides trying to one up each other, doing more and more extravagant things in space. It truly wouldn't end, it would just continue going on and on. This would leave both parties devastated. Lots of passengers would probably lose their lives, citizens would get tired of the ongoing competition, and they would waste millions of dollars. Now, I want to briefly touch on the incident that occurred in January of 1967. In America, their spacecraft caught fire during a launch to Simulation. Three astronauts were killed in this incident. Soviet Russia winning the space race would make them feel like these three individuals died in vain. They risked their life and their team still lost. That would make their team members feel pretty crappy. They can either go about this two ways lose hope and quit, or push through to make those three men proud. Additionally, former NASA historian Roger Lanius doesn't believe the US would have succeeded in trying to send humans on other deep space missions if they lost the space race. He says, and I quote, if you publicly announce that you lost the moon race and that your technology was not up to snuff and your economy was not sufficient to support it and all the other stuff that goes along with an admission of failure, why would you turn around and say, Oh no, we're not going to do that. We're now going to do something that's at least in order of magnitude more difficult. You're setting yourself up for failure a second time. It would definitely be a huge embarrassment. They wouldn't want others to see them fail again. So they may just stop focusing on space travel and instead put their focus on something else. But Roger Lanius and Howard McCurdy both believe that the US would have proposed the idea of a joint venture with the Soviet Union. They would make some sort of deal with them to get an American man to the moon. Hey, maybe it would be the beginning of a long friendship between the two. Or the Soviet Union would have been like, back off, you're only being nice to us because you lost, why should we help you? Who knows? what America will offer them in exchange. If they are desperate enough, they may make a drastic deal with the Soviets. Roger and Howard also believe that if the Soviets won the space race, then the fall of the Berlin Wall probably wouldn't have happened. Not only that, but the Soviet Union may still have had control over most of Eastern Europe. Then some undecided countries may have allied with the Soviets instead of the Americans. This would be a huge accomplishment for Soviet Russia. I can't emphasize that enough. Their propaganda would be insane. They would be going on on and on for days, months, and years about their victory. Maybe they will get more countries on their side and become a more powerful force. Not only that, but maybe the undecided states would think that communism was the way to go. They may think that if they follow communism, then they too can make such remarkable achievements. So that's pretty much it. The US will either give up on space travel completely or push through and try to beat the Soviets in other areas. I can't see them going down without a big fight though. Seems more likely that it will be an ongoing competition. Meanwhile, the Soviets will be super cocky and feel like they are the leaders of the world. <laughs> <laughs>